Heidegger's Later Philosophy When we look back today on the time between the two world wars, we can see that this pause within the turbulent events of our century represents a period of extraordinary creativity. Omens of what was to come could be seen even before the catastrophe of World War I, particularly in painting and architecture. But for the most part, the general awareness of the time was transformed only by the terrible shock that the slaughters of World War I brought to the cultural consciousness and to the faith and progress of the liberal era. In the philosophy of the day, this transformation of general sensibilities was marked by the fact that, with one blow, the dominant philosophy that had grown up in the second half of the 19th century, in renewal of Kant's critical idealism, was rendered untenable. The collapse of German idealism, as Paul Ernst called it in a popular book of the time, was placed in a world historical context by Oswald Spengler's The Decline of the West. The forces that carried out the critique of this dominant neo-Kantian philosophy had two powerful precursors, Friedrich Nietzsche's critique of Platonism and Christendom, and Soren Kierkegaard's brilliant attack on the Reflexion Philosophie of speculative idealism. Two new philosophical catchwords confronted the neo-Kantian preoccupation with methodology. One was the irrationality of life, and of historical life in particular, in connection with this notion, one could refer to Nietzsche and Bergson, but also to the great historian of philosophy, Wilhelm Dilthe. The other catchword was existens, a term that rang forth from the works of Søren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher of the first part of the 19th century, whose influence was only beginning to be felt in Germany as a result of the Diedrich's translation. Just as Kierkegaard had criticized Hegel as the philosopher of reflection who had forgotten existence, so now the complacent system-building of neo-Kantian methodologism, which had placed philosophy entirely in the service of establishing scientific cognition, came under critical attack. And just as Kierkegaard, a Christian thinker, had stepped forward to oppose the philosophy of idealism, so now the radical self-criticism of the so-called dialectical theology opened the new epoch. Among the forces that gave philosophical expression to the general critique of liberal culture piety and the prevailing academic philosophy was the revolutionary genius of the young Heidegger. Heidegger's appearance as a young teacher at Freiburg University in the years just after World War I created a profound sensation. The extraordinarily forceful and profound language that resounded from the rostrum in Freiburg already betrayed the emergence of an original philosophical power. Heidegger's magnum opus, Being in Time, grew out of his fruitful and intense encounter with contemporary Protestant theology during his appointment at Marburg in 1923. Published in 1927, this book effectively communicated to a wide public something of the new spirit that had engulfed philosophy as a result of the convulsions of World War I. The common theme that captured the imagination of the time was called existential philosophy. The contemporary reader of Heidegger's first systematic work was seized by the vehemence of its passionate protest against the secured cultural world of the older generation and the leveling of all individual forms of life by industrial society, with its ever stronger uniformities and its techniques of communication and public relations that manipulated everything. Heidegger contrasted the concept of the authenticity of Dasein, which is aware of its finitude and resolutely accepts it, with the they, idle chatter and curiosity, as fallen and inauthentic forms of Dasein. The existential seriousness with which he brought the age-old riddle of death to the centre of philosophical concern, and the force with which his challenge to the real choice of existence smashed the illusory world of education and culture, disrupted well-preserved academic tranquillity. And yet, his was not the voice of a reckless stranger to the academic world, not the voice of a bold and lonely thinker in the style of Kierkegaard or Nietzsche, but of a pupil of the most distinguished and conscientious philosophical school that existed in the German universities of the time. Heidegger was a pupil of Edmund Husserl, who pursued tenaciously the goal of establishing philosophy as a rigorous science. Heidegger's new philosophical effort also joined in the battle cry of phenomenology, to the things themselves. The thing he aimed at, however, was the most concealed question of philosophy, one that for the most part had been forgotten. What is being?
In order to learn how to ask this question, Heidegger proceeded to define the being of human Dasein in an ontologically positive way, instead of understanding it as merely finite, that is, in terms of an infinite and always existing being, as previous metaphysics had done. The ontological priority that the being of human Dasein acquired for Heidegger defined his philosophy as fundamental ontology. Heidegger called the ontological determinations of finite human Dasein determinations of existence existentials. With methodical precision, he contrasted these basic concepts with the categories of the present at hand that had dominated previous metaphysics. When Heidegger raised once again the ancient question of the meaning of being, he did not want to lose sight of the fact that human Dasein does not have its real being in determinable presence at hand, but rather in the dynamic of the care with which it is concerned about its own future and its own being. Human Dasein is distinguished by the fact that it understands itself in terms of its being. In order not to lose sight of the finitude and temporality of human Dasein, which cannot ignore the question of the meaning of its being, Heidegger defined the question of the meaning of being within the horizon of time. The present at hand which science knows through its observations and calculations, and the eternal, which is beyond everything human, must both be understood in terms of the central ontological certainty of human temporality. This was Heidegger's new approach. But his goal of thinking being as time remained so veiled that being and time was promptly designated as hermeneutical phenomenology, primarily because self-understanding still represented the real foundation of the inquiry. Seen in terms of this foundation, the understanding of being that held sway in traditional metaphysics turns out to be a corrupted form of the primordial understanding of being that is manifested in human Dasein. Being is not simply pure presence or actual presence at hand. It is finite, historical Dasein that is in the real sense. Then the ready-to-hand has its place within Dasein's projection of a world, and only subsequently does the merely present at hand receive its place. But various forms of being that are neither historical nor simply present at hand have no proper place within the framework provided by the hermeneutical phenomenon of self-understanding. The timelessness of mathematical facts, which are not simply observable entities present at hand. The timelessness of nature, whose ever-repeating patterns hold sway even in us and determine us in the form of the unconscious, and finally, the timelessness of the rainbow of art, which spans all historical distances. All of these seem to designate the limits of the possibility of hermeneutical interpretation that Heidegger's new approach opened up. The unconscious, the number, the dream, the sway of nature, the miracle of art, all these seem to exist only on the periphery of Dasein, which knows itself historically and understands itself in terms of itself. They seem to be comprehensible only as limiting concepts. It was a surprise, therefore, in 1936, when Heidegger dealt with the origin of the work of art in several addresses. This work had begun to have a profound influence long before it was first published in 1950, when it became accessible to the general public as the first essay in Holzweger. For it had long been the case that Heidegger's lectures and addresses had everywhere aroused intense interest. Copies and reports of them were widely disseminated, and they quickly made him the focus of the very idle chatter that he had characterized so acrimoniously in being in time. In fact, his addresses on the origin of the work of art caused a philosophical sensation. It was not merely that Heidegger now brought art into the basic hermeneutical approach of the self-understanding of man in his historicity, nor even that these addresses understood art to be the act that founds whole historical worlds, as it is understood in the poetic faith of Hilderlin and George. Rather, the real sensation caused by Heidegger's new experiment had to do with the startling new conceptuality that boldly emerged in connection with this topic. World and Earth were key terms in Heidegger's discussion. From the very beginning, the concept of the world had been one of Heidegger's major hermeneutical concepts. As the referential totality of Dasein's projection, world constituted the horizon that was preliminary to all projections of Dasein's concern. Heidegger had himself sketched the history of this concept of the world, and in particular had called attention to, and historically legitimated, 
The difference between the anthropological meaning of this concept in the New Testament, which was the meaning he used himself, and the concept of the totality of the present at hand. The new and startling thing was that this concept of the world now found a counter-concept in the earth. As a whole in which human self-interpretation takes place, the concept of the world could be raised to intuitive clarity out of the self-interpretation of human Dasein, but the concept of the earth sounded a mythical and Gnostic note that, at best, might have its true home in the world of poetry. At that time, Heidegger had devoted himself to Hodelin's poetry with passionate intensity, and it is clearly from this source that he brought the concept of the earth into his own philosophy. But with what justification? How could Dasein, being in the world, which understands itself out of its own being, be related ontologically to a concept like the earth, this new and radical starting point for all transcendental inquiry? In order to answer this question, we must return briefly to Heidegger's earlier work. Heidegger's new approach in being and time was certainly not simply a repetition of the spiritualistic metaphysics of German idealism. Human Dasein's understanding of itself out of its own being is not the self-knowledge of Hegel's absolute spirit. It is not a self-projection. Rather, it knows that it is not master of itself and its own Dasein but comes upon itself in the midst of being and has to take itself over as it finds itself. It is a throne projection. In one of the most brilliant phenomenological analyses of being and time, Heidegger analyzed this limiting experience of Dasein, which comes upon itself in the midst of beings, as disposition, Befindlichkeit, and he attributed to disposition or mood, Stimmung, the real disclosure of being in the world. What is come upon in disposition represents the extreme limit beyond which the historical self-understanding of human Dasein could not advance. There was no way to get from this hermeneutical limiting concept of disposition or moodfulness to a concept such as the earth. What justification is there for this concept? What warrant does it have? The important insight that Heidegger's The Origin of the Work of Art opened up is that earth is a necessary determination of the being of the work of art. If we are to see the fundamental significance of the question of the nature of the work of art, and how this question is connected with the basic problems of philosophy, we must gain some insight into the prejudices that are present in the concept of philosophical aesthetics. In the last analysis, we need to overcome the concept of aesthetics itself. It is well known that aesthetics is the youngest of the philosophical disciplines. Only with the explicit restriction of Enlightenment rationalism in the 18th century was the autonomous right of sensuous knowledge asserted, and with it the relative independence of the judgment of taste from the understanding and its concepts. Like the name of the discipline itself, the systematic autonomy of aesthetic states from the aesthetics of Alexander Baumgarten. Then in his third critique, the critique of aesthetic judgment, Kant established the problem of aesthetics in its systematic significance. In the subjective universality of the aesthetic judgment of taste, he discovered the powerful and legitimate claim to independence that aesthetic judgment can make over against the claims of the understanding and morality. The taste of the observer can no more be comprehended as the application of concepts, norms, or rules than the genius of the artist can. What sets the beautiful apart cannot be exhibited as a determinate, knowable property of an object, but manifests itself in a subjective factor. The intensification of the Lebensgefühl, life feeling, through the harmonious correspondence of imagination and understanding. What we experience in beauty, in nature as well as in art, is the total animation and free interplay of all our spiritual powers. The judgment of taste is not knowledge, yet it is not arbitrary. It involves a claim to universality that can establish the autonomy of the aesthetic realm. We must acknowledge that this justification of the autonomy of art was a great achievement in the age of the Enlightenment, with its insistence on the sanctity of rules and moral orthodoxy. This is particularly the case at just that point in German history, when the classical period of German literature, with its centre in Weimar, was seeking to establish itself as an aesthetic state. These efforts found their conceptual justification in Kant's philosophy. 
Basing aesthetics on the subjectivity of the mind's powers was, however, the beginning of a dangerous process of subjectification. For Kant himself, to be sure, the determining factor was still the mysterious congruity that obtained between the beauty of nature and the subjectivity of the subject. In the same way, he understood the creative genius, who transcends all rules in creating the miracle of the work of art, to be a favorite of nature. But this position presupposes the self-evident validity of the natural order that has its ultimate foundation in the theological idea of the creation. With the disappearance of this context, the grounding of aesthetics led inevitably to a radical subjectification in further development of the doctrine of the freedom of the genius from rules. No longer derived from the comprehensive whole of the order of being, art comes to be contrasted with actuality and with the raw prose of life. The illuminating power of poesy succeeds in reconciling idea and actuality only within its own aesthetic realm. This is the idealistic aesthetics to which Schiller first gave expression and that culminated in Hegel's remarkable aesthetics. Even in Hegel, however, the theory of the work of art still stood within a universal ontological horizon. To the extent that the work of art succeeds at all in adjusting and reconciling the finite and the infinite, it is the tangible indication of an ultimate truth that philosophy must finally grasp in conceptual form, just as nature, for idealism, is not merely the object of the calculating science of the modern age, but rather the reign of a great creative world power that raises itself to its perfection in self-conscious spirit, so the work of art, too, in the view of these speculative thinkers, is an objectification of spirit. Art is not the perfected concept of spirit, but rather its manifestation on the level of the sense intuition of the world. In the literal sense of the word, art is an intuition of the world. Welt and Schauung. If we wish to determine the point of departure for Heidegger's meditation on the nature of the work of art, we must keep clearly in mind that the idealistic aesthetics that had ascribed a special significance to the work of art as the organon of a non-conceptual understanding of absolute truth had long since been eclipsed by neo-Kantian philosophy. This dominant philosophical movement had renewed the Kantian foundation of scientific cognition without regaining the metaphysical horizon that lay at the basis of Kant's own description of aesthetic judgment, namely, a teleological order of being. Consequently, the neo-Kantian conception of aesthetic problems was burdened with peculiar prejudices. The exposition of the theme in Heidegger's essay clearly reflects this state of affairs. It begins with the question of how the work of art is differentiated from the thing, the work of art is also a thing, and only by way of its being as a thing does it have the capacity to refer to something else. For instance, to function symbolically, or to give us an allegorical understanding. But this is to describe the mode of being of the work of art from the point of view of an ontological model that assumes the systematic priority of scientific cognition. What really is, is thing-like in character. It is a fact. Something given to the senses and developed by the natural sciences in the direction of objective cognition. The significance and value of the thing, however, are secondary forms of comprehension that have a mere subjective validity and belong neither to the original givenness itself nor to the objective truth acquired from it. The Neo-Kantians assume that the thing alone is objective and able to support such values. For aesthetics, this assumption would have to mean that even the work of art possesses a thing-like character as its most prominent feature. This thing-like character functions as a substructure upon which the real aesthetic form rises as a superstructure. Nikolai Hartmann still describes the structure of the aesthetic object in this fashion. Heidegger refers to this ontological prejudice when he inquires into the thing character of the thing. He distinguishes three ways of comprehending the thing that have been developed in the tradition. It is the bearer of properties, it is the unity of a manifold of perceptions, and it is matter to which form has been imparted. The third of these forms of comprehension, in particular, the thing as form and matter, seems to be the most directly obvious, for it follows the model of production by which a thing is manufactured to serve our purposes. Heidegger calls such things implements. Viewed theologically from the standpoint of this model, things in their entirety appear as manufactured items, that is, as creations of God. 
from man's perspective, they appear as implements that have lost their implement character. Things are mere things, that is, they are present without reference to serving a purpose. Now, Heidegger shows that this concept of being present at hand, which corresponds to the observing and calculating procedures of modern science, permits us to think neither the thing-like character of the thing, nor the implement character of the implement. In order to focus attention on the implement character of the implement, therefore, he refers to an artistic representation, a painting by Van Gogh depicting a peasant's shoes. The implement itself is perceived in this work of art, not an entity that can be made to serve some purpose or other, but something whose very being consists in having served, and in still serving, the person to whom it belongs. What emerges from the painter's work, and is vividly depicted in it, is not an incidental pair of peasant shoes. The emergence of truth that occurs in the work of art can be conceived from the work alone, and not at all in terms of its substructure as a thing. These observations raise the question of what a work is that truth can emerge from it in this way. In contrast to the customary procedure of starting with the thing character and object character of the work of art, Heidegger contends that a work of art is characterized precisely by the fact that it is not an object, but rather stands in itself. By standing in itself, it not only belongs to its world, its world is present in it. The world of art opens up its own world. Something is an object only when it no longer fits into the fabric of its world, because the world it belongs to has disintegrated. Hence, a work of art is an object when it becomes an item of commercial transaction, for then it is worldless and homeless. The characterization of the work of art as standing in itself and opening up a world with which Heidegger begins his study consciously avoids going back to the concept of genius that is found in classical aesthetics. In his effort to understand the ontological structure of the work independently of the subjectivity of the creator or beholder, Heidegger now uses earth as a counter-concept alongside the concept of the world to which the work belongs and which it erects and opens up. Earth is a counter-concept to world insofar as it exemplifies self-concealment and concealing as opposed to self-opening. Clearly, both self-opening and self-concealing are present in the work of art. A work of art does not mean something or function as a sign that refers to a meaning. Rather, it presents itself in its own being so that the beholder must tarry by it. It is so very much present itself that the ingredients out of which it is composed, stone, colour, tone, word, only come into a real existence of their own within the work of art itself. As long as something is mere stuff awaiting its rendering, it is not really present. That is, it has not come forth into a genuine presence. It only comes forth when it is used, when it is bound into the work. The tones that constitute a musical masterwork are tones in a more real sense than all other sounds or tones. The colours of a painting are colours in a more genuine sense than even nature's wealth of colours. The temple column manifests the stone-like character of its being more genuinely in rising upward and supporting the temple roof than it did as an unhewn block of stone. But what comes forth in this way in the work is precisely its concealedness and self-concealing, what Heidegger calls the being of the earth. The earth, in truth, is not stuff, but that out of which everything comes forth, and into which everything disappears. At this point, form and matter as reflective concepts prove to be inadequate. If we can say that a world arises in a great work of art, then the arising of this world is at the same time its entrance into a reposing form. When the form stands there, it has found its earthly existence. From this, the work of art acquires its own peculiar repose. It does not first have its real being in an experiencing ego, which asserts, means, or exhibits something, and whose assertions, opinions, or demonstrations would be its meaning. Its being does not consist in its becoming an experience. Rather, by virtue of its own existence, it is an event, a thrust that overthrows everything previously considered to be conventional, a thrust in which a world never there before opens itself up. But this thrust takes place in the work of art itself in such a fashion that at the same time it is sustained in an abiding, ins bleiben geborgen. That which arises and sustains itself in this way constitutes the structure of the work in its tension. 
It is this tension that Heidegger designates as the conflict between the world and the earth. In all of this, Heidegger not only gives a description of the mode of being of the work of art that avoids the prejudices of traditional aesthetics and the modern conception of subjectivity, he also avoids simply renewing the speculative aesthetics that define the work of art as the sensuous manifestation of the idea. To be sure, the Hegelian definition of beauty shares with Heidegger's own effort the fundamental transcendence of the antithesis between subject and object, I and object, and does not describe the being of the work of art in terms of the subjectivity of the subject. Nevertheless, Hegel's description of the being of the work of art moves in this direction, for it is the sensuous manifestation of the idea, conceived by self-conscious thought, that constitutes the work of art. In thinking the idea, therefore, the entire truth of the sensuous appearance would be cancelled. It acquires its real form in the concept. When Heidegger speaks of the conflict between world and earth, and describes the work of art as the thrust through which a truth occurs, this truth is not taken up and perfected in the truth of the philosophical concept. A unique manifestation of truth occurs in the work of art. The reference to the work of art in which truth comes forth should indicate clearly that for Heidegger it is meaningful to speak of an event of truth. Hence Heidegger's essay does not restrict itself to giving a more suitable description of the being of the work of art. Rather, his analysis supports his central philosophical concern to conceive being itself as an event of truth. The objection is often made that the basic concepts of Heidegger's later work cannot be verified. What Heidegger intends, for example, when he speaks of being in the verbal sense of the word, of the event of being, the clearing of being, the revealment of being, and the forgetfulness of being, cannot be fulfilled by an intentional act of our subjectivity. The concepts that dominate Heidegger's later philosophical works are clearly closed to subjective demonstration, just as Hegel's dialectical process is closed to what Hegel called representational thinking. Heidegger's concepts are the object of a criticism similar to Marx's criticism of Hegel's dialectic, in the sense that they too are called mythological. The fundamental significance of the essay on the work of art, it seems to me, is that it provides us with an indication of the later Heidegger's real concern. No one can ignore the fact that in the work of art, in which a world arises, not only is something meaningful given to experience that was not known before, but also something new comes into existence with the work of art in itself. It is not simply the manifestation of a truth. It is itself an event. This offers us an opportunity to pursue one step further Heidegger's critique of Western metaphysics and its culmination in the subjectivism of the modern age. It is well known that Heidegger renders aletheia, the Greek word for truth, as unhiddenness. But this strong emphasis on the privative sense of aletheia does not mean simply that knowledge of the truth tears truth out of the realm of the unknown or hiddenness in error by an act of robbery. Privatio means robbery. It is not the only reason why truth is not open and obvious and accessible as a matter of course, though it is certainly true that the Greeks obviously wanted to express it when they designated beings as they are, as unhidden. They knew that every piece of knowledge is threatened by error and falsehood, that it is a question of avoiding error and gaining the right representation of beings as they are, if knowledge depends on our leaving error behind us, truth is the pure unhiddenness of beings. This is what Greek thought had in view, and in this way it was already treading the path that modern science would eventually follow to the end, namely to bring about the correctness of knowledge by which beings are preserved in their unhiddenness. In opposition to all this, Heidegger holds that unhiddenness is not simply the character of beings, insofar as they are correctly known, in a more primordial sense, unhiddenness occurs, and this occurrence is what first makes it possible for beings to be unhidden and correctly known. The hiddenness that corresponds to such primordial unhiddenness is not error, but rather belongs originally to being itself. Nature, which loves to hide itself, Heraclitus, is thus characterized not only with respect to its possibility of being known, but rather with respect to its being. It is not only the emergence into the light, but just as much the hiding of itself in the dark. It is not only the unfolding of the blossom in the sun, 
but just as much its rooting of itself in the depths of the earth. Heidegger speaks of the clearing of being, which first represents the realm in which beings are known as disclosed in their unhiddenness. This coming forth of beings into the there of their Dasein obviously presupposes a realm of openness in which such a there can occur. And yet it is just as obvious that this realm does not exist without beings manifesting themselves in it, that is, without there being a place of openness that openness occupies. This relation is unquestionably peculiar, and yet even more remarkable is the fact that only in the there of this self-manifestation of beings does the hiddenness of being first present itself. To be sure, correct knowledge is made possible by the openness of the there. The beings that come forth out of unhiddenness present themselves for that which preserves them. Nevertheless, it is not an arbitrary act of revealing, an act of robbery, by which something is torn out of hiddenness. Rather, this is all made possible only by the fact that revealment and hiddenness are an event of being itself. To understand this fact helps us in our understanding of the nature of the work of art. There is clearly a tension between the emergence and the hiddenness that constitute the being of the work itself. It is the power of this tension that constitutes the form niveau of a work of art and produces the brilliance by which it outshines everything else. Its truth is not its simple manifestation of meaning, but rather the unfathomableness and depth of its meaning. Thus, by its very nature, the work of art is a conflict between world and earth, emergence and hiddenness. But precisely what is exhibited in the work of art ought to be the essence of being itself. The conflict between revealment and concealment is not the truth of the work of art alone, but the truth of every being. For, as unhiddenness, truth is always such an opposition of revealment and concealment. The two belong necessarily together. This obviously means that truth is not simply the mere presence of a being, so that it stands, as it were, over against its correct representation. Such a concept of being unhidden would presuppose the subjectivity of the Dasein that represents being, but beings are not correctly defined in their being if they are defined merely as objects of possible representation. Rather, it belongs just as much to their being that they withhold themselves. As unhidden, truth has in itself an inattention and ambiguity. Being contains something like a hostility to its own presentations, as Heidegger says. What Heidegger means can be confirmed by everyone. The existing thing does not simply offer us a recognizable and familiar surface contour. It also has an inner depth of self-sufficiency that Heidegger calls its standing in itself. The complete unhiddenness of all beings, their total objectification, by means of a representation that conceives things in their perfect state, would negate this standing in itself of beings and lead to a total leveling of them. A complete objectification of this kind would no longer represent beings that stand in their own being. Rather, it would represent nothing more than our opportunity for using beings, and what would be manifest would be the will that seizes upon and dominates things. In the work of art, we experience an absolute opposition to this will to control, not in the sense of a rigid resistance to the presumption of our will, which is bent on utilizing things, but in the sense of the superior and intrusive power of a being reposing in itself. Hence the closeness and concealment of the work of art is the guarantee of the universal thesis of Heidegger's philosophy, namely that beings hold themselves back by coming forward into the openness of presence. The standing in itself of the work betokens at the same time the standing in itself of beings in general. This analysis of the work of art opens up perspectives that point us further along the path of Heidegger's thought. Only by way of the work of art were the implement character of the implement, and in the last analysis, the thingness of the thing, able to manifest themselves. All calculating modern science brings about the loss of things, dissolving their character of standing in themselves, which can be forced to do nothing into a calculated elements of its projects and alterations. But the work of art represents an instance that guards against the universal loss of things, as Rilke poetically illuminates the innocence of the thing in the midst of the general disappearance of thingness, 
by showing it to the angel, so the thinker contemplates the same loss of thingness while recognizing at the same time that this very thingness is preserved in the work of art. Preservation, however, presupposes that what is preserved still truly exists. Hence, the very truth of the thing is implied if this truth is still capable of coming forth in the work of art. Heidegger's essay, What is a Thing?, thus represents a necessary advance on the path of his thought. The thing, which formerly did not even achieve the implement status of being present to hand, but was merely present at hand for observation and investigation, is now recognized in its whole being, in signum heilen sign, as precisely what cannot be put to use. From this vantage point, we can recognize yet a further step on this path. Heidegger asserts that the essence of art is the process of poeticizing. What he means is that the nature of art does not consist in transforming something that is already formed or in copying something that is already in being. Rather, art is the project by which something new comes forth as true. The essence of the event of truth that is present in the work of art is that it opens up an open place. In the ordinary and more restricted sense of the word, however, poetry is distinguished by the intrinsically linguistic character that differentiates it from all other modes of art. If the real project and the genuine artistic element in every art, even in architecture and in the plastic arts, can be called poetry, then the project that occurs in an actual poem is bound to a course that is already marked out and cannot be projected anew simply from out of itself the course already prepared by language. The poet is so dependent upon the language he inherits and uses that the language of his poetic work of art can only reach those who command the same language. In a certain sense, then, the poetry that Heidegger takes to symbolize the projective character of all artistic creation is less the project of building and shaping out of stone or color or tones than it is their secondary forms. In fact, the process of poeticizing is divided into two phases, into the project that has already occurred where a language holds sway, and another project that allows the new poetic creation to come forth from the first project. But the primacy of language is not simply a unique trait of the poetic work of art. Rather, it seems to be characteristic of the very thing-being of things themselves. The work of language is the most primordial poetry of being. The thinking that conceives all art as poetry, and that discloses that the work of art is language, is itself still on the way to language.